Lindsay Wallace with us to talk about what it's like to be a physician's assistant. Welcome, Lindsay. Hi. <laughs> so how long have you been in that role? So um, in my current role as a PA, I have been um, in my professional role, I guess, a little over two years. And then before that, I did a, um, it's not required to be a physician assistant, but I did a fellowship in critical care and that was one year. Um, so I guess I was still kind of working as a certified PA. So I guess my role in critical care has been about three and a half years then. <laughs> and what is it about a PA that allows you to work with patients different from a doctor? So. I might see you or I might see a doctor, but you might do the same thing. So can you tell me the differences and how that plays out? Yeah, so um, actually before I even knew what a PA was, I actually was, you know, in high school, I wanted to be a doctor was what I told everybody. Um, so as a physician, uh, the training is much, much longer. My um, significant other is actually in um, residency now to, for anesthesia. Um, so I have some firsthand experience with that. and. Um, that training is, is much, much longer. The cost is much more, um, but there is also more responsibility and there's more work hours required for it. Um, and also physicians are board certified in one particular uh, field of medicine. As a physician assistant, the reason I chose that field had nothing to do with grades, qualifications or anything. It was actually that I wanted to be able to one, change my field. So if I wanted to start out in critical care and say in five years, I was like, you know what, I'm done with this. I want to do pediatrics. I could do that as a PA. Or if I wanted to say, I want to do surgery instead, I could go and do surgery. Um, also, if you wanted to do something very intense, like cardiac surgery, which is ultimately actually what I originally wanted to do. Um, the training to do that as a physician is much, much longer. So you have first the four years of medical school, then um, at least five years of surgical residency, and then you have your fellowship for cardiac surgery on top of that. And that's all before you're even making physician money. Um, so as a PA, you can do your undergrad just like you would pre-med, and then you go to PA school for two and a half years, and then you start working right away and you're trained on the job. So yes, your pay is not the same as a physician, but over time, you're kind of your net loss and gain ends up being very similar by the time you're, I think when I calculated it was like in the mid mid 50, you were basically making the same amount of money before the physicians start making essentially more, you were probably like 55 years old. Um, and also as a PA, you can be working as a first assist in these surgeries. Like as a PA student, I had my hands in the chest, sewing grafts and doing everything. They ultimately during my rotation, let me close the chest completely by myself. Um, and that's stuff that they would let the PAs do over time as they gain experience. And then what's nice is you go home and you're not totally responsible for all the nitty gritty stuff. You're just getting to do the hands-on clinical stuff. And at the end of the day, you know, you can kind of leave the rest to the rest of the team. And that's different in every role. So a PA's role is actually up to the level of the license of the physician you're working under. And that's how most states are. Every state's a little different, but as a PA, you can do whatever your supervising or collaborating physician is allowed to do. So that's why the role, the role is completely flexible. So when you start out as a new grad, of course, you're going to be probably watched a lot closer and you're probably not going to be for example, putting in some, you know, doing some major surgeries by yourself because you're new. But if you've been doing this for 30 years, like during some of my rotations, the surgeon would come in and say, hey, you good? And then the PA who has been doing this longer than the surgeon actually was like, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I'll call you if I need you. So the scope is very variable and it's also dependent on the state that you practice in as well. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, I appreciated the the money talk of the two because sometimes people get hung up on that money piece and, yeah. and don't realize that what you described in regards to the length of time and taking on more classes and debt so I appreciate that yeah and as a resident I can speak for my significant other you make basically enough to, to live um and that's not much more than that. <laughs> so it's not like you know during all these years of training oh I'm going to be making all this money you're really not. And the thing is, a PA um, is that you're 
you know, you have less debt that you're going to be, and you can also pick schools like state schools that are cheaper. Um, but also when you start, you're getting paid, you know, a pretty decent salary. I'm sure that eventually you're going to get into that and <laughs> questions about that. Um, but you're getting paid a pretty decent salary from the beginning. And then it only goes up with experience. So, um, you know, that's why ultimately you can't be going into being a physician strictly for the money because that will not be enough to get you across the finish line and get through those 80 hours a week when you're doing your training you know you have to want that level of responsibility and want that that type of leadership role and um for the job itself not necessarily for just the paycheck at the end of the day well and i'm glad you mentioned that because i'm curious uh, how you got started i mean you mentioned the doctor and kind of researching but what what is it inside you that drives you to want to do this? So it's kind of interesting. So I grew up in lower middle class. Um, no one in my family ever went to college. And it was frustrating for me as a kid. I, my dad had passed away when I was young. Um, and we really didn't have a lot of money. And so I was frustrated anytime we went to the grocery store and I wanted a candy bar. And my mom was like, we don't, we can't get a candy bar this week. Like we don't have the money to be doing that. And the thing that I thought when I was probably about like 11 years old was that I don't ever want to have to worry about that. I want to have a job where I know I have a good income and that when I go to school, I will have a job at the end of the day. And I will, even though like, yes, I have a lot of student loans because in medicine, you're always going to have a lot of student loans. The training is very expensive, um, but my job can pay it off. And so and at the end of the day, I'm going to live comfortably within my means and be able to give my fam family and friends really nice gifts and be able to buy that candy bar that I never could have when I was younger. And, you know, on top of that, I wanted a job that was needed. So no matter where I went in the world, people will be sick. I mean, we have a pandemic right now, <laughs> um, but people will always be sick. So having the skills to be able to treat patients and diagnose patients was something that I really valued because of course I was looking at the physician role. Um, I've always seen myself as a leader. I'm someone that um, sets very high standards for myself. Um, ultimately the decision to be a PA versus a doctor was you know, based on the scope of practice that I could flip my field around. The length of training um, and also I'm, I'm a very fast learner I'm a hands on learner so I just have to see something once and I can perform the, the hands on task really quickly. So for me, um, you know any procedural or surgical job like critical care where we're putting breathing tubes in putting big uh, central lines in, chest tubes things like that. I, that I do very well with like on the job training. Um, and so as a PA, you have to be a fast learner. A lot of PA programs actually uh, discourage students who take classes twice because it shows that you needed to go over that material twice. And as a PA, it's basically crash course med school. It's um, you know like drinking from a fire hydrant is the way they describe it often because they basically take all the nitty gritty points of medical school and get rid of all the weird zebras that maybe you won't really see and then they cram that into a really short time. You don't really get any vacations or breaks during it. Um, like most other programs would have like breaks during their, like med school has some breaks and stuff. You don't get as many of those in PA school. And you know, that concrete core rigorous curriculum is really what I, I've thrived with. Um, and the requirements to get into PA school, I'm from originally from New York, so it's a little bit more rigorous out in the East Coast, more competitive, there's more programs, um, but their, their standards are very high. I'm not 100% familiar with the PA programs out here in the Midwest, um, but I can speak for the ones in the Northeast. You know, our average GPA coming in was like a 3.6 or 3.7, which is basically the similar to med school applications. Mm -hmm. We had like, I think a 3% acceptance rate. So it's not to say that you're not as smart enough to be a doctor and that's why you chose PA. That's not what the profession is. And actually, you know, it should not be your backup plan because that's actually, you know, not why you go into being a PA. You go into being a PA for the love of, you know, caring for these patients, doing the clinical work, you know, and at the end of the day, still having a life. And it's okay to say that if you're interviewing and wanting to be a PA, it's that I want to, 
you know, serve patients. And I also want to have a personal life, um, which was really interesting to me because I had said that in my interview when I um, applied for, I did an early acceptance PA program um, where I applied right from high school. So I was a senior, junior in high school, sorry. And I had, um, you know, just taken all my tests and things. And I had contacted um, this Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences out in New York. And they had a program that um, I would get a bachelor's degree, but I would already be accepted as long as I maintained a good GPA and got clinical hours and experience, I would get straight into PA school. And when I had heard how difficult it was to get into PA school and med school, I was like, oh, this is perfect. I don't want to have to worry about applying. This is perfect for me. Um, and also it was a pharmacy education for an undergrad degree. So all of my classes, even my chemistry, biology, we were synthesizing aspirin, we were synthesizing uh, mucinex, you know, things like that, where most of your chemistries might not always be medical. So for me, this was like, oh, this is a shoe in like, why wouldn't you want to do this? This makes your life so much easier. Um, so I guess roundabout way of giving you lots of information there. Um, but yeah, it, it, the PA role in and of itself is definitely, um, it's not it's something that you do as a backup plan. It's definitely usually your plan A if you're choosing to do so. Well, that's great. What would you say would be a starting pay to, to be in that role? Like first year out practicing? Yeah, so um, first year out, so I, the American Academy of PAs, the AAPA is the national like, um, you know, group for PAs, right. they put out a salary report every year. So that's something that you could always look into and seeing what specialty, you know, pays what. Um, I was actually recently looking at this. <laughs> so I found that across the US, it's about I think, um, so I'm practicing between two and three years experience. So I would fall probably about like 110 on median, 110,000. Starting salary is probably at least 100,000. I know that when I had graduated in 2017, they told us do not accept a job less than 100,000 because you are worth more than that. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much kind of where you're starting at. And every place that you work will value your experience. So to be a PA, you need three things to apply to PA school. So that's, you've went to high school, you got your diploma, you went to undergrad, you got your graduate in, you graduate uh, your bachelor's degree, and then you apply to PA school. And so you need um, a good GPA. So I would say competitive GPA, especially in your core sciences, you want to have good grades. Um, you also need to have clinical hours of experience. So very competitive programs will require more hours. So if a program only requires like 50 hours of hands-on patient experience, probably not the best program to be applying to. It might be the best to apply to programs that have requiring like a thousand hours of patient care experience because they want you to have the experience of touching patients, interacting with patients, knowing you want to do this. Just like in med school, they require you to have volunteer experience before you really apply or research experience. PA school requires you to have clinical experience that's not volunteer based and it's actually like a responsibility of a job. And then the other thing is the GRE, which is the, I think the graduate, I don't remember what it stands for, something exam. So it's basically like the SATs for graduate mm -hmm. school. Um, and that, you know, for me, when I did my early acceptance, they actually waived that. So I didn't have to do that, which as someone who was a nervous test taker, um, that was something that I was very, very, I was fortunate not to have to take that because so basically I did well enough in high school where they looked at my high school transcript and said, hey, you know, we can trust that she's going to do well in college. She doesn't need to do this GRE part. We're just going to expect that she has a good GPA and get those clinical hours and we'll keep her going through PA school. So there's many programs out there like that. They're very selective. Um, but if you're devoted to becoming a physician assistant, I would say that is definitely the route to at least try to go through. Um, so that being said, coming right out of your graduating PA school, you can expect at least 100,000, hopefully depending on your field. Of course, if you work in a cardiothoracic surgery, your starting salary might be like 150,000. But keep in mind that you might be working 50, 60 hours a week. So your hourly pay ends up being similar, if not less than what you would be making if you were working, you know, hospital, you know, just not more of like a salary base than a shift work. Um, there's different, you can work different jobs as well. So for me, like right now, I work in a medical ICU and I did a fellowship 
It was not required. As a PA, you do not have to do extra training like a residency or fellowship. I chose to do a fellowship because I just wanted to do everything I could to make sure that my resume always looked great. And I know that once you finish school, you're not, you're very rarely going to go back, you know, and say, oh, I've been making all this money. Let me go back and take a pay cut to do an extra year training. Like most people don't do that. So I was like, let's just do it now. I'm, I'm used to living poor because I've been in college. So I'll just do it. And, you know, the set, the stipend you usually get for that is around 40 to 50,000 a year um, for that one year. And then when you're done, you either get a certificate or an accreditation. It, it's not super common to do it. I would highly recommend anybody that wants to do any specialty like critical care, cardiothoracic surgery, you know, general surgery even to do a fellowship or a residency because it really will make a difference in your education. And then coming out of that, actually my pay was essentially escalated by quote five years. So my one year of fellowship counted essentially as if I were practicing for five years. So my pay boost was much greater. So I ended up with like, I think it was at least 20 grand more on my starting salary because I had that one year of fellowship. So yes, I took a pay cut there, but then you take that 20 grand and you add it, you know, over time, it ends up paying itself off. Um, so that's, I think that's another way to boost your salary and also boost your competitiveness because more people are trying to be nurse practitioners, PAs, and this is a way you can make yourself stand out. Um, and another way too is as a PA, you can get your doctorate. So some people, you know, I actually just finished my doctorate and I just earned my doctorate uh, this December. Congratulations. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> um, so it was an online program. It's, um, and it's mostly research. So it's not as nearly as intense as PA school, um, but it teaches you a lot about how to read a research paper, how to write and conduct your own research. Um, and that's what the doctorate in any doctorate program really should be doing is teaching you more about research. Um, I wouldn't say that that necessarily raises your pay or, you know, gives you any extra oomph about like pay scale, but I think that it makes you much more competitive in an academic setting when you're applying for a job. For sure. So when I have a 16 and 17 year old student watching this and they're thinking, wow, she, she got started right in high school. What classes should they take in high school to get them on the path you did? So I actually, um, you know, when I, like I mentioned, I knew I wanted to be in medicine around the age of 12. So what I, from that point on, I found anything that I could, even if it was extracurriculars that was medicine related. I think that really made a huge difference in applying to PA school in that joint program early on. It showed that I had a, a history of wanting to do this for more than just my application the time that I filled it out. I devoted time that was extra to that. So they, we had like this medical, um, medical training camp thing. It was through my local hospital and students of all ages actually were there, like even elementary school kids, which kind of felt a little weird, but there were a couple of us that were in our junior year of high school. And it was amazing because that's the first time I actually they let they taught us how to intubate a patient and put a breathing tube in and obviously we would never be doing that until we were clinicians but the fact that they took the time to teach it to us that's when I fell in love with like critical care and like really really sick patients and procedures because you know putting a breathing tube in you have to make sure you get it in the windpipe and not the food pipe right the, the trachea not the esophagus and I remember I was one of the only, the few people who, who did it correctly. And that resonated with me so much. So those little moments that give you a boost of confidence that, yeah, I do want to do medicine. I really want to do this. If you can search out any of those type of clinical experiences, that would be a huge thing that would really make you, oops, sorry, that would make you shine above everybody else. Um, the other thing for classes in particular, if you can take an anatomy and physiology class, that's huge because that way, you know, you're not trying to retain that information forever like you were, you would be in PA school itself because, you know, the your patient's lives are at stake when you're learning then. But in high school, you're getting yourself familiar with these words. You're familiar so that the next time you learn them in your undergrad education, and then again in PA school, it's just a refresher. So I had a very rigorous anatomy and physiology course where our teacher basically asked us, I want you to memorize as many of the bones as you can. And if you memorize all the bones, I want you to start memorizing the, the little foramina, the little tuberosities. And 
my goal, of course, as a typical overachiever was to beat the record he had. Um, and, you know, he had that record until someone came along just like me and beat my record. Um, but something like that, I think, is huge. Because then when I saw all of the anatomy and physiology in my undergrad education, I was like, oh, I know this. This is easy. Like, I've already seen this. So I could focus on more details instead of the big picture stuff that other students were seeing for the first time. And then, of course, this might sound a little different, but um, I would highly recommend taking advanced classes that will give you college credit in things that are not science related. So you like your history, English, things like that, because then you don't have to worry about taking them as your entry level classes in college and you just get the credit and you can move on. And so then you can focus on your science courses or even take higher level courses when you're in college, because it's really hard to I found at least at our pharmacy school for undergrad students that had, you know, advanced chemistry and tested out of like their first level chemistry or had AP credit or college credit. They ended up taking it again anyway because it was highly recommended because jumping right into like organic chemistry in your freshman year is really difficult and it's not expected and it's probably better that you don't do that. So most students really didn't do well when they did that. If anything, it really helped everybody if you had your English credit already done so you didn't have to worry about that class and then instead then you could take, for example, like bioethics. So instead of me attending my English class every day, I took um, one of the classes I took was uh, drugs of abuse so i learned about you know cocaine heroin how those mm -hmm. all work in the the brain and stuff i wouldn't have been able to take that had i not had my credits transfer in from these you know easier fluff classes that weren't science related so i think that would be something to consider if if that's something that you're looking forward to doing is taking all these like extra interesting science classes and if a student's watching this um maybe not interested in science but just wanting to explore and listen what general advice would you have for that person about their future and their career path? So I would probably say that as much as we're always trying to lift each other up and do whatever you can to, you know, get by and it's okay, you're trying your hardest, it's okay. Your grades matter. Your grades matter. So when it comes down to studying for your test and, you know, your friends are getting together watching a movie you will not look back and regret not watching that movie. You will regret looking back and saying, oh, I got a C plus in chemistry. And ew, that's the one thing that like these programs are really looking down on. So I would say take your first year, at least your first year, very seriously. It's okay to have fun, but make sure that like your grades are something that once they're on your transcript, they're very hard to replace and very hard to transition away from. And of course you don't wanna take a class, like I said, for PA school, med school might be a little different. They're probably a little more forgiving with that, but it definitely with PA school, they really don't like when you take classes twice. Um, so take grades very seriously and make sure you're effectively studying. Don't sit there and just rewrite your notes. If you're spending an hour studying, that hour studying should be very effective. And if you find that you're not like feeling like I'm retaining this information, change it up, figure out what type of learner, learner you are. So one of the things I ended up doing, of course, I was a, a, like a tutor in the basic sciences and um, an organic chemistry teaching assistant. And I would have all of my students that would come to see me figure out what kind of learner they are. So it's called the VARC, V-A-R-K. And the VARC is, will tell students if they're primarily a visual, auditory, reader, write, or kinesthetic learner. And of course, we always embody all these different types of learning, you know, throughout the course of education. But for me, for example, I'm an auditory learner primarily and also a kinesthetic learner. And I don't do well with reading and writing. So for me, reading and rewriting my notes and over and over again, I would not retain anything doing that. For me, talking it out with a friend, asking each other questions back and forth, drawing out different diagrams, that is how I learn the best. And you know, had I not known that, I could have spent hours rewriting notes, making my notes look pretty, but I wouldn't have learned anything. So I think that's something to really make sure that you can figure out what type of learner you are, channel that in. And oh, even if you don't think that you need to see a tutor, get to know your tutors. I would go see my tutors in undergrad all the time. If it was just like a really complicated subject or the instructor was like, well, you know, people really struggle with this. Even though I felt like I understood it, I booked an appointment with the tutor and went over it so that I made sure that I wasn't studying the wrong 
thing. Because in college, you know, you're in some of these really large classrooms and you don't have time to meet with the instructor all the time. Um, so that's something that, you know, going to see a tutor, there's no shame in doing it, even if you know everything you're doing. That was like my easiest two Ds that would come to me were the ones that just wanted to check in and make sure everything was going well. Um, so that's another thing, you know, take that very seriously and there's no shame in that. But um, also at the same time, uh, remember to be professional and social media follows you. Um, social media is big right now. And I can guarantee that every program, colleges and even, you know, PA programs, will look through social media to see what your profile looks like. So during your time of application, clean that up. <laughs> Make sure, you know, maybe even if you wanted to, you know, have one of your friends take a really nice looking headshot for you and to make it your profile picture during that time, because someone will be likely looking at that at some point. Yes, lots of good advice. Thank you so much for your time today, Lindsay. Yes, no problem. Thank you for having me. And if anyone has any other questions, I actually um, have a, a PA student blog um, that I wrote like at least one entry a week for all of PA school. And I talk about what it takes to become a PA um, in there and the grades and stuff. Um, it's called www.lindsay.weebly.com. And it's still you know active and you can message me or email me on there too if you have any direct questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem.